Uh, sure, Justin, uh, thanks for uh, asking everyone whether they are already dead. Now, now you have really the last speaker. Uh, let, let me start by thanking Bea and, and Brad for putting up this, this wonderful meeting. When I got your email first, I, I thought, too ambitious. And you know what it means when you get this in a grand review, right? It cannot be done. And, and you proved us wrong, at least me wrong. I mean, you, you've done an uh, incredible job. We had a wonderful yesterday, today, and I'm sure you'll have a great day tomorrow. Uh, what I want to do uh, now in the next, in the last 20 minutes, is uh, to tell you about population neuroscience. And, and the reason for me, at least, I got into this is that uh, I, I realized that we know a lot about the structural and functional organization of the human brain and of course also about its development. But what I thought we don't really know much about is what is behind the incredible inter-individual variability that we saw today also in all those plots with those huge standard deviations, with those uh, large confidence intervals. And in order to understand or start understanding what is shaping the brain, we really don't have any other choice but to go to genes and the environment and, of course, their interplay. And one way of doing it is to bring together three disciplines uh, in the context of population neuroscience. I'll start by telling you a little bit about it. And then I'll give you two examples of how we, uh, we apply this approach and tell you about brain gr growth and adversity, and then if I have time, brain response to faces. So first, population neuroscience, really what I mean by that is bringing together three disciplines, epidemiology and genetics, and neuroscience. The first two are meant to tell us about exposures. Epidemiology, of course, about external exposures, and genetics about, if you like, internal exposures. And what we know best, of course, how to do is outcomes, and that's where neuroscience comes in, both outcomes and, of course, potential mechanisms. Now, in terms of epidemiology, just the basics, of course, the epidemiologists since 1850s, uh, John Snow studying the outbreak of cholera in London, it's all about uh, calculating risk ratio, ratio of having a particular disease or condition as a function of exposure, exposed to non-exposed. And of course, since the original work on infectious diseases, we've moved uh, to lots of different conditions. To us, just one example that, that is of interest to this group, here is a nice epidemiological study with a few more participants than what we are used to, uh, showing that uh, gestational age would have profound impact on the risk of different mental disorders, in this case, odds ratios of seven uh, uh, increasing the risk of bipolar disorder, being born premature or just a bit premature still increases the risk ratio. But why is that? That's the beginning. Epidemiology, observational epidemiology gives us some ideas, some interesting observations, but then of course we need to go and figure out what the mechanisms and causality uh, of those associations are. So genetics comes in, in many, for many different reasons, but one of them is that it does allow us to get at some of the mechanistic pathways. That's one way of using genetics. Of course, we are using different uh, types of genetic variations. We are also using variations in the state of the genes, methylation, acetylation state, epigenetics, that is telling us a little bit about the probability of gene expression. I won't talk about that today. And of course, uh, as I said, neuroscience and in particular imaging is really providing us with this wonderful tool to get uh, quantitative phenotypes. And we've been hearing a lot about functional imaging here, but uh, uh, I think that it's equally important to be uh, looking at, uh, at also structural images because the structural images are re really providing us with uh, a window into the history of an individual. And the reason I'm saying that is to go back again to Bill Greeno and others who showed very clearly that if you change environment, uh, in this case for 30 days after weaning, environment of rats, uh, their rearing environment, you change profoundly uh, the structure of their brain. So just 30 days of being with friends in a cage would make your f uh, brain very different. Now, keep in mind that what we see with MRI is a mix of, of course, all those cellular elements, so we have to be extremely careful 
uh, when interpreting uh, the findings. Now, as you all know, you have heard about many different cohorts. When we were starting 10 years ago, there were not that many. It was really only Jay Geats and Julie Drapaport cohort from NIMH. But the list of uh, typically developing uh, cohorts of children and adolescents is, is really growing. I highlighted here three uh, with an asterisk. These are birth cohorts that uh, are being scanned at different uh, time points. In some cases, only when, uh, for example, Alspag and Northern Finland birth cohort, small samples, uh, uh, only at the age of young adulthood. But obviously, there is a lot of new knowledge that will be coming out of those, in particular, birth cohorts, because you know the history. And, and that will be a very interesting challenge for us to see how much that history that has been collected over the past 20 years, for example, with the Auspark data set, how much that history predicts the presence of the brain. Now, uh, let me move on into two examples now of uh, the work that we have been doing. And the first one is about one of the environments that uh, unfortunately is still highly prevalent, adverse environment uh, and uh, specifically maternal smoking during pregnancy. And as you can see, even though uh, about, you know, in the 60s when I was born, um, half of the mothers smoked during pregnancy and so if we are to believe in fetal programming, half of us uh, have been changed forever. And, and, and that's most likely true. Uh, the situation, yes, it looks much better now, 10% on average. But look, I mean, these are data from this country. And, and non-Hispanic uh, non white women, on average, 20% of them smoke during pregnancy. So uh, the situation is not that rosy. And so let me. That, that's just to motivate uh, your brain to keep your attention up a little bit for the next section. So uh, let me start with not a population study, but with a very small study. Uh, Mariah showed you that fetal imaging is not a very easy thing to do. What we did, we just imaged uh, fetuses of 10 pregnant women, 10 who smoked, 10 who did not smoke. And you can see that uh, we imaged them twice, 24 and 32 weeks post-conception. Uh, and you can see on that image that you can measure not only the size of the brain, but also many other program, uh, organs, like kidneys, lungs, uh, et, et cetera. Now, you also heard that the kids move. Uh, you see, that's the difference of 15 minutes scanning this, this little uh, girl. Uh, she did move quite a bit, right? So a lot of chasing during fetal imaging. Now, here are the results. So you see the growth of the brain is much slower. The rate of growth is much slower uh, in uh, the exposed uh, fetuses compared with the non-exposed. Even with this tiny little sample, we explain about 13% of variance in the size of the brain. And that's true about most of the other organs, except for the lungs, in fact. Now, uh, let me move now into uh, the first population-based study. That's the Sagone Youth Study that we have started about 10 years ago now in uh, Sagone Lac Saint Jean region, part of Quebec uh, in Canada. The region is special in that that uh, it's uh, uh, home of uh, the largest genetic founder population in North America, and therefore it's suitable for genetics of complex traits because it's uh, it's uh, uh, both genetically and environmentally more more homogeneous than uh, cosmo uh, more cosmopolitan or uh, outbred populations. And we set up the study in such a way that half of the participants, and these are adolescents between 12 and 18 years of age, would have been exposed in utero to maternal cigarette smoking, and the other uh, half, non-exposed, were matched to the exposed by maternal education, therefore eliminating or minimizing uh, one of the main differences between uh, moms who smoke and don't smoke, that is, their education. Uh, now, uh, the first question now, uh, are the brains different in terms of their size? I just show you the fetal data, so we would expect there might be a slight difference. There is none. Uh, this is brain volume in girls and boys, non-exposed, exposed, no difference really. So now we ask, uh, could there be differences if there is a different genetic background? So let's start by looking for a gene or genes that are important for brain uh, development. And we will do that using genome-wide association study. We'll be looking for that association across about 600,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms. And as you can see, we have a genome-wide significant hit uh, in girls only. 
uh, in a gene that has something to do with uh, uh, tetramerization of potassium channels. Let's just put aside for a minute uh, the potential function. So now, with this particular polymorphism, we can see that the brain volume, we explain 19% of variance in brain volume with that uh, genetic variation. That's a lot. But that's a lot because, in fact, our sample is small, homogeneous, and therefore the statistical significance would pull out only large effects. And I would argue that's a good thing. Uh, it's not always good to need 20,000 or 100,000 participants so that you can detect 0.1% variance. So that's my little pitch for small studies rather than everything has to be big. Now, uh, this is exposed and non-exposed. We see something similar. But then we uh, dissect the phenotype in a very simple way. We just measure now cortical area. Of course, it correlates with brain volume, but not perfectly. Cortical folding and thickness. And we see that now uh, the total cortical area, we explain 22% uh, with this genetic variation in the exposed and none in non-exposed. So we have a very strong gene environment interaction. And what we think is going on potentially is that the genetic variation in the tetramerization, potassium channel tetramerization, may be influencing apoptosis. We know that, for example, adversity, including smoking during pregnancy, would trigger apoptosis. We know that uh, influx of potassium activates all those pro-apoptotic genes. And now imagine this is happening during the symmetric phase of brain development. Of course, it would reduce tremendously the number of uh, neurons and therefore the cortical area. So that's really uh, the explanation or speculation that, uh, with which we explain these findings. So the last part, uh, which is a bit more, uh, well, which is novel and, uh, and not published yet, the other one you can read about in detail, and this one goes really into faces. And, and as we all know, I mean, we look around, lots of information that we can get from the faces, lots of people I know in the audience, I can, of course, recognize, well, on most part, men and women, and I always get confused with the hair of the color, but. Uh, there are color of the hair, but uh, uh, we, we can extract a lot of information. So there is a tremendous uh, power when we see the face, the brain is really uh, extracting all that information. What, what, what are the parts of the brain that do that? We just showed our kids and, and participants in different studies very simple video clips of ambiguous faces, simple block design, takes six minutes in total. They don't have to do anything. We just ask them after the scan. Uh, what they did, and as you can see, some of them are angry, uh, and the other ones are ambiguous. Now, when you do that, uh, when you do that in a large study, such as the Imagen, where we apply this paradigm, so that's 2,000 adolescents uh, collected across eight different sites in Europe. When you do it in the first uh, set, it was 1,000. You can, someone said, uh, with this number you don't need statistics, and that's why we in fact talk about probability of activating or engaging a particular part of the brain. We don't care about the t-value now. We care about the probability in that population with which those different brain regions were engaged by faces. And you see what you would expect, that the right hemisphere is engaged to somewhat a higher extent than the left hemisphere, but the response is symmetrical, I should point out. And also that the ambiguous faces are engaging uh, the brain to a higher extent than the angry faces. Well, perhaps because they are ambiguous. I won't tell you about the sex differences here, but you can guess them, but that's, that's published in this paper. Now, this is just a different uh, view of, of the data, just to show you that amygdala, of course, responds to faces very strongly, and it doesn't have to be angry face. Uh, it responds equally well or even more to ambiguous faces. So now we will ask, uh, of course we are interested in uh, the shaping of that brain response to faces, and, and of course genetics is the easiest uh, part always because we have all those genes from that single blood sample, but let's not get carried away and ask first, do we have good signal and do we have heritability? of uh, the brain response to faces before we go into uh, searching for the individual genes. And we know from this nice study that was published a few years ago that at least 
processing of faces, different tasks, different face tasks uh, in a, a total sample, there is a, a solid genetic contribution to the performance on those different face tasks. And as you can see, the genetic contribution is growing with age, comparing the young children and adolescents and young adults. You can see that the heritability, uh, the genetic contribution from this twin study is stronger in the older ones. Now, can we check heritability in our sample? Of course, this is not a twin study. And we can, because there is a nice a technique that was developed uh, over the past few years where we can take all the SNPs now, uh, not uh, test one by one, but take those 600,000 SNPs and ask all together, do they predict, does the genetic variance captured by the composite of those 600,000 genes, does it predict phenotypic variants, right? So because in fact, when we look around this room, and I did that here, some of us are more related to each other than to someone else. And so I can build a matrix of similarity, genetic similarity, based on those 600,000 SNPs, and ask therefore whether that, uh, those differences in our similarities have something to do with the uh, differences in the similarity of the brain response. And, and that has been used, this approach has been used for many different phenotypes, to start with, with height, where we know with the twin studies we can explain 60 to 80 percent of variance in height uh, based on genetic similarity. In fact, on individual SNPs, if we add them all up, still only 10 percent, but when we use this GCTA, genome-wide complex trait analysis approach, we can explain much more variants. So we'll do that now with our data, and we do that with six, uh, 1,600 unrelated individuals, so we are excluding everyone who is closer than second cousin, even though we, are, we, were, not in, uh, we were not recruiting them. There happen to be some third cousins in the sample, right? So they are excluded. And we'll be looking now at the similarity of the person bold in those 25 regions that I identify. And when we do that, we see that in some regions, but not in many other, we have a significant heritability. That is, the genetic variance captured by those 600,000 SNPs is predicting variability in the bold response to faces. So now, of course, the question is, why these and not these? What's different about those two, uh, two sets of regions? And one thought that we had was to now look at connectivity uh, in this matrix of 25 regions. And you can see if I threshold it arbitrarily at 0.3, you can see that some pairwise correlations are there, some are not. And at least qualitatively, it looked like those regions that were heritable might have had a bit more connections with other regions. And so we used node degree to evaluate it uh, statistically, and you can see that in fact, uh, the amount of genetic variance that predicts, the amount of phenotypic variance predicted by the genotypic variance correlates with the degree of the node. That is, with the number of connections at that threshold point three that those regions have with other regions. So uh, now we can leave it for later. What, uh, what drives that? Is that a biological property of those regions that we bring out uh, in this particular context? Or is it that we have more signal to work with because those regions are connected more than others? So the final slide, really, I think that what we have been hearing today and what I'm, the way that I'm thinking about development is really uh, in the context of developmental cascades, and, and Mastin uh, has, has done a great job in describing them. Uh, cascades that are really happening over time and across domains and levels. And it's very important that we keep in mind that none of those relationships, except for this one, and not even that one, are unidirectional. It's all going in a circle or in both ways. And I will stop here by thanking my collaborators and also uh, uh, because I couldn't tell you everything that I know, you can read some of it in, in the book that I wrote last year. So uh, go and have it. Thanks.
Okay, so I was going to say that was a great talk, and I'm really interested by what you and Damien in particular were talking about as far as trying to look at the heterogeneity in the population and get closer to the individual level. You sort of saying, let's look at all these genetics features. Damien saying, let's look at all these behavioral features, all these brain features to try to understand closer to the individual. And I'm wondering, are we there yet? Like, are we at the point where we can actually take somebody, you know, look at their full profile of behavioral, brain, genetic features, whatever we can get, and really just say something about an individual, not even necessarily in the context of no. population. No, <laughs> we are not there yet. And, but I think that uh, the approach that Damon described and, and we are thinking about, of course, as you can imagine, in the Sargona Youth Study, we have this massive database of information about all those participants that is both genetic, but also we have six-hour cognitive battery, for example, right? We have cardiovascular and metabolic uh, workout. Uh, so, so yes, we are thinking of uh, pulling it all together and, and trying to apply some of the more uh, sophisticated techniques to see whether they, they are profiles. I can tell you that they are profiles, for example, in, pre in, in the face task, uh, profiles of how the left hemisphere responds to faces, and, and I can use those profiles to predict the right hemisphere. In a large number of individuals, out of the 1,600 of them, I can pick their hemisphere from all 1,600 right hemispheres. Now, this is measuring something at exactly the same time in the scanner, right? But that's, if I could not do that, then forget about your uh, question, right? 